Okay, hello guys. We're uh, back in Papa's Pod. Papa's Pod. Yeah, it's uh, my my new podcast. I feel a little awkward here. The the roles are kind of reversed. Usually, uh, a Vinay is uh, interviewing me on his uh, podcast plenary session, but the today things are switched up. It, it's me talking with him. Uh, so this man needs no introduction. Uh, he's now. Um, a full professor at the young age of 40. Oh, yeah. That's pretty fast. Young age of 40. <laughs> <laughs> at the University of California, San Francisco, one of our, our sister school. We're down here now in sunny San Diego, even though it's a little overcast today. Uh, he's in town, so we're gonna. he's going to be uh, one of my first guests on my podcast. And uh, for those of you new to the show, uh, this is kind of where we break down things, uh, 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 whether it's diseases like leukemias, lymphomas, or concepts, we make things simple for fellows and practicing physicians. We're not going to get into the weeds of like MRD this and like titrating cell and X or none of that, okay? We're going to just, uh, some basics, and, and we're going to go over statistics today, medical statistics, trial analysis, and no one better uh, uh, in the med Twitter universe is better suited to discuss this than Dr. Prasad, so uh, go for it. It's good to be here, Aaron, yeah. and it's good to be in Papa's studio. And I, I like it. I like what you're doing with the show. So you asked me to talk about, and by the way, titrating cell and extra is easy. It's easy to just discontinue. Yes, that, easy, yes. <laughs> never yeah. prescribe. Right. Okay. So we're going to talk about, and this is basically he gave me 0% time to, zero time. We to didn't prepare prepare There's no this. preparation, but he wants statistics 101. Okay. So where do you want to start in statistics? I always wonder, um, and you know, one, you could start with diagnostic tests. You could start with a whole bunch of places. But for the oncologists out there listening, I think the place you want to start, the first thing you really want to think about is the Kaplan-Meier plot. Mm -hmm. Because we spend our lives making decisions about people in clinic based on the Kaplan-Meier plot. And people put a lot of stock in it. People quote hazard ratios. They tell you recently- What is a hazard ratio? You know, yeah, what is a hazard ratio? Hazard ratio is the ratio of the instantaneous hazard rate at all moments in time between one arm and the other arm. It's not exactly the same thing as a relative risk. I think a classic fallacy is people conflate the two and they talk about hazard ratios as, as if it is a relative risk reduction, but often a relative risk reduction, say at two years or three years, a certain landmark relative risk reduction is a slightly different number than the hazard ratio. Recently, we were on Twitter and there was a new drug that had something like a 1.5 month median PFS benefit. I think this was so totally oh, lung cancer drug. Yeah, that was a game changer. Yeah. Game changer, practice yeah. changing. Practice changing one point some odd months. And the PI of the study said, I prefer not to look at the difference in the median. I prefer to look at the hazard ratio. But that's a really odd preference because it has no meaning for any patient or doctor out there in the real world. Okay, so since this is something that is so important, I thought we'd talk about Kaplan-Meier plot a little yeah. bit. So what, what is, you know, for someone opening the journal, we know what the curves, but what are they actually telling us, Kaplan-Meier curves? Yeah, so I think one, I think it's important for people to acknowledge that it's actually quite clever. Like what is the, what, what is clever about this method? You run a randomized control trial and a Kaplan-Meier plot is a measure of a randomized control trial. And it's gonna show you something over time, typically the time until some event happens. It's a time to event outcome in a Kaplan-Meier plot. And what Kaplan and Meyer realized was when we run a randomized trial, let's say we open in 2017, not all 500, and it's a 500 person randomized trial. Everybody doesn't present on day one in your clinic to be randomized. You enroll probably 20 people a month in the first month, then 22 people, then 25 people, and then many, many months of 25 people until you finally hit 500 people. You know, you're enrolling people over time. So what Kaplan and Meyer say is that now we talk about it's 2020. You've been running your trial for three years. We want the first look at the data. How do we look at this data, knowing that some people have three years of observation and some people have maybe even only two months of observation or they just enrolled last week? And the Kaplan Meyer method is a beautiful method to pool all the data together. And it basically says, we're going to look at the most amount of information this data set. For all the people we know, what happened to them in the first week after therapy, we're gonna use the data for all those people. And what about people in week two and in week three and week four and week five, whoever we had at the start of week four, by the end of week five, we're gonna use their data. And we're gonna extrapolate the outcomes in the people we happen to follow for longer as if those outcomes would have been had by all of the people if we'd followed it out long enough in time. Okay, so put another way, it's like maximum information harvesting. Two, it's assuming what will happen to people in the future in whom we don't have those results, but it's doing that based on the people we happen to follow longer. And the big assumption is that like, you shouldn't be any different if you enrolled in January, 2017 versus December, 2020. So this is the assumption of like uninformative, uninformative censoring. We're gonna like drop some people out along the way and we're gonna average the results of the people we have 
but it's going to be uninformative because the people we happen to follow longer are no healthier, wealthier, or wiser than those that happen to enroll more at least, recently. At least the, the Kaplan-Meier assumes that piece of information. So it basically takes the maximum, takes with the data we're given and gets the maximum amount of information from it. Right. Okay, to generate these. So so what happens, you know, say I'm a patient on a, a randomized clinical trial and uh, I'm lost to follow up. I, I, what does that mean? How does that displayed on the, on the uh, Kaplan-Meier and what's that called? Good question. So it's displayed typically on the graph with a vertical tick mark at the moment that the person was lost to follow up, and it's called censoring. In other words, we don't know what happened to Bob who stopped showing up, but we do know what happened to all these other people, and we're going to assume what happened to Bob would have been the same had he come in. Okay. Now let's talk about endpoints for a minute because I think it'll tie back yes. into this. Okay. So Kaplan-Meier plots are always the time until some event happens. And by definition, it couldn't have happened when you started. So that's why you either always start at 100% or you start at 0%. Okay, so it either goes up over time or goes down over so time. So time to event endpoints, just what are some examples of those time to event endpoints? Overall survival is the classic because everyone's alive when they started the study and they can only die over time. Progression-free survival is the unique one in our field. It's a composite endpoint, meaning one of several things could happen. Whichever comes first gets scored as the endpoint. Those things are the disease gets 20% bigger. It gets 20% bigger than the smallest it ever was. So if it shrinks first and gets bigger, it's from the nadir value. There are new lesions on cats, the CAT scan that weren't there at starting point, or you die, whichever comes first. And so that's a composite time to event. The cardiology friends, they got like major adverse cardiovascular events or MACE. And that's typically a composite of like myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, hospitalization, or death, whichever comes first. You know, so we have our own. Nephrology, they have a composite, which is like, you go blind, mm. you're on dialysis, or your A1C goes up half a point. You know, so, sorry. <laughs> so, so you know, so three equally important value, you know, but the joke is, of course, not all the metrics in the composite are equally important. Okay, the reason it's important is that you could be censored if the primary endpoint is PFS, it could have censoring in a way that doesn't exist for OS. So let me explain that a little bit. Let's say Bob stops showing up to my trial, but I can still often in many cases figure out when Bob died. Like even though he no-showed to my trial, he has a social security number, he has a family, we can contact, the company can make inquiries and we can find out, oh, he died on this date. And so we can keep him in the plot, right? We're not missing the data. But let's say Bob stop, stops showing up to the trial and he stops coming for those Q six weeks or eight week scans. Well, I don't know when he progressed then. I really do have to censor him and I can't you know, resurrect that data from a social security. And record. again, the censoring of Bob is relying on the previous results to make an informed decision. Right, the censoring of Bob is assuming that Bob is the same as the 10 people who stayed. But Bob might not be the same. And that's the key. Yeah, yeah. Bob might not be the same. Okay, so before I come to that part, I just want to say one thing about Kaplan-Meier plots. There's an old rule of thumb, which is when less than 10% of people are at risk, put your hand over that side of the plot. So we often see presentations where people are like, oh, you know, even though the result looks terrible, look at that tail of the curve. And that's when you say less, that's because a lot of patients have been censored or had the event right. by that point. So the, yeah, those those beautiful tails at the end, you know, there's two people there, it doesn't seem to matter. Correct. But and it can look like it matters. Right. Yeah. So the tail looks like it's a plateau. You look under the curve and it says four or seven or two or one. And you started with 500. What that tells you is there's so few people out there. It just happens to be that Jim and Susie are alive. And Jim and Susie haven't had the event. And if Susie has the event, that curve is going to drop 50% yeah. from where it is. Um, that is very, very unreliable or noisy. That curve isn't telling you that you're, they're cured because there's so few people out there. It happens to be the, the happenstance of these two people. So I always say, if you start with 500, the moment that at risk number gets below 50, just put your hand over that. Don't even look at it because you can't really hang your hat on that curve. So I call them tails and fairy tales. Fairy tale is when there's only two people out there. All right, now back to the sensory. Um, I think this is the most important thing for like the trainees to know. With overall survival, you can get censoring. And typically you get censoring is like after they get randomized, the group that was randomized to the control arm, because our trials often use sort of dubious control arms, there's a high rate of dropout immediately afterwards. And that is because people like go to hell. They yeah, throw their they're disappointed with what they were uh, enrolled on. They're disappointed. And yeah. they throw it in your face. And that can be a problem because those people are not as healthy, wealthy, or wise. Typically, they're healthier, wealthier, and wiser because they have more socioeconomic resources. They're connected. They know they can tell the trialist to go shove his trial, but they'll still get good care elsewhere. So that's the kind of person who typically is disappointed and throws in the towel. So that's when you see immediate drop-off uh, in a Kaplan-Meier. Yeah. So it's censoring, but it's probably because they know what's up. 
because they know what's up and they're no longer participating, yeah. right? So that's an immediate early censoring event. And uh, in fact, it tends to happen that way. Control arms typically have more early censoring. Now, conversely, there every once in a while you read a trial and there's a lot more censoring on the experimental arm very early. Um, this is an Everlimus Bolero yes. study, Everlimus exemestane versus exemestane. Now that tells you typically is that people started popping the new pill and within the first week, they're like, shove it, take this pill and throw it away. That tells you usually toxicity, has a lot of toxicity. Okay, those things are important because if there's an imbalance in the number of people who drop out, that can't be explained by enrollment because we're constantly randomizing sort of equally over time. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Time zero, everyone's equal. Equal, right. It's got to be some other factor. Yeah. And once it gets high enough, then it's no longer, I like to say, it's not even a randomized study. It's a study of the people who are randomized in one arm and a subset of the people who are randomized in the other arm. And that's dependent on sort of the differences of people, the covariate differences, which really kind of tells you that why even run a randomized trial? You know, you, you're not solving the problem of making it otherwise balanced. And so again, just to recap, the, the hint of seeing this and this, this phenomenon we call informed censoring or- I would say, yeah, at least differential censoring. Differ and you yeah. can assume it's informative, yeah. like it might affect the outcome. Yeah, and you would, the hint of this is you see a huge amount of censoring early on in the Kaplan-Meier curve, which would be noted how on the Kaplan-Meier, how would you do see that? Yeah, so a few, a few things that would show you that. One, a lot of tick marks on one okay. side, not the other. Two, in the Lancet journals, they put the number of people censored in so a, a huge drop off. And put it in a parenthesis. So it'll be like 100 and then 16 people, and the other will be 100 and like two. You know, it'll tell you every time point. And the other way to look at it is you can see the number at risk over time and also how far the curve falls. And you can kind of calculate that the only reason the number at risk drops is that they had the event or they were censored. Those are only two reasons. And if the events don't account for the full drop, it's got to be a lot of censoring so yeah. that, that requires some calculation. Okay. And, and again, that can, as you said, it's, we spent all this time to make this lovely randomized trial, but within a month, if a lot of people are dropping on the control uh, due to censoring because uh, uh, they didn't like it, then that you kind of lose the beauty of the randomization, correct? Yeah. You lose the value, which was you're trying to sort of get two equal groups, but they're not equal anymore because one group's got, like in Sotorosib, I think it's 15% of people are gone in one group. And was that the dose of taxol? Well, that's know. the uh, or, uh, that's the code break two hundred. This yes. lung cancer thing. Okay. Yeah, versus dose of taxol. Um, and they're gone the dose of taxol arm, as you say, because they're disappointed. Um, and what that tell? And then the, the trialists make a lot of effort to try to get the reader to believe the people quitting are the sickest people. I find that a little bit hard to believe because I would suspect that they're the most socioeconomically well advantaged people who tend to quit because um, they have the ones who have other options. Uh, and people who are desperate, you know, dose of taxol might be all that they have. So I guess, what are the key lessons here? One, when you look at a Kaplan-Meier plot, I think it's important to look at the shape of the curve. It's important to look at relative risks at landmark time points, like two-year survival, three-year survival, one-year survival. It's important to look at the median differences. I don't look a lot at the hazard ratio. I think that's not the right, it's a unitless, dimensionless, clinical correlate-less concept. I wouldn't look at that. The next thing I look at is the tail. I don't put a lot of stock in tails with low numbers. And then the next thing I look at is for censoring. It can be different for scan-based endpoints versus endpoints that you can follow people even if they stop showing to clinic. And there are often imbalances in censoring. Um, now, one thing that people say is sometimes there's an imbalance in censoring like the treatment arm has less censoring towards the end of the curve. And that's usually explained by a good treatment because they're still on the drug, you know, where the control arm, they're either progressing or dropping off more. And so, you know, that might be an explanation for the end of the curve, but I like to look at early censoring and imbalances. And I think that's, that's yeah. really sort of what I take away for the Kaplan-Meier plot. No, I actually think, you know, you listen to this. I mean, I really, this, I, I just learned quite a bit, you know, about Kaplan-Meier, something we say, oh, it's a picture. It's easy to see the curves are different and there's a, there's a benefit. But uh, honestly, just listening to that 10 minute talk on Kaplan-Meier curve uh, and going through that, that uh, process that you described of how you go through it really will change the way I think people look at articles and, uh, I think that's a, it's a nice jewel. No, I, I really liked it. We're learning here. So I, I think let's not overload ourselves with statistics. I think this is fine. And then we learned Kaplan Myers and uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Prasad back to go over some other confusing things uh, over the course of the podcast. Uh, until then, we'll see you guys later.